Joe Alton, MD, also known as Dr. Bones of doomandbloom.net, where you'll find close to 800, wow, 800 posts, videos, and podcasts on medical preparedness for any disaster. Together with my wife, Amy Alton, a nurse practitioner, we're the Amazon and New York Times bestselling authors of the Survival Medicine Handbook, right here, and other books, plus the designers of the board game Doom and Bloom Survival, named by the Prepared Family blog as the Teaching Preparedness Resource of the Week. This is part three of our series on primary triage for mass casualty incidents. Make sure you check out parts one and two. Now, at the end of part two, we described the mass casualty incident scene with 20 victims. We told you about initial considerations before beginning START, S-T-A-R-T, simple triage and rapid treatment, and also the RPM system for determining triage level. Referring back to the five S's from part one of the series, let's say you have already determined the safety of the current situation and sized up the scene. A bomb has exploded, but there are no hostiles nearby, as far as you can tell. Therefore, you believe the danger is past. A pretty big assumption, I'll admit. The injuries are significant. The victims are all in an area no larger than, say, 30 yards. The incident occurred on a main thoroughfare on the village, so there are ways in and ways out. You have sent for help by contacting others on your handy talkie. Several group members have replied, including a former ICU nurse. The area is relatively open, so you can set up different areas for various triage categories. Now you can perform the fifth S, which is simple triage and rapid treatment, otherwise known as START. You call out as loudly as possible. I'm here to help. Everyone who can get up and walk and needs medical attention, get up and move to the sound of my voice. If you are uninjured and can help, follow me. You're lucky, 13 of the 20, mostly from the periphery of the blast, sit up or at least try to. 10 of them can stand and eight go to the area that you designated for walking wounded. These people have cuts and scrapes. A couple of them are limping. One obviously has broken an arm. Two bruised but sturdy individuals join you. By communicating, you've made your job easier by identifying the walking wounded, the green tags, and getting some immediate help. You still have 10 victims down. Your two helpers are an able-bodied man and woman. You have no medical equipment with you other than some oral airways and triage tags to work with. You go to the nearest victim on the ground and you proceed you go to the nearest victim on the ground and you proceed in an organized manner to the next nearest victim in turn. In this way, you will triage faster and more effectively than trying to figure out who needs help the most from a distance. Now, it's important to remember that you're triaging, not treating. The only treatments in START will be the control of heavy bleeding, the opening of airways, and the elevating of legs in case of shock. Evaluation and primary triage consists mostly of quick evaluation of RPMs, as we mentioned earlier. R, respirations, or the lack thereof. P, perfusion, adequacy of circulation, as measured by capillary refill time, CRT, and pulse. And mental status. To review these parameters, check out part two of this video series. Remember, 32 can do from part two. 30 or more respirations a minute more than two seconds capillary refill time, and can or cannot follow commands. If there's any doubt as to the category, always tag the highest priority triage level. Not sure between yellow and red? Tag red. Once you have identified someone's triage level, tag them, move immediately to the next patient unless you have major bleeding to stop. Any one RPM check that results in red, in a red tag, tags that person as red regardless of anything else. As you go from patient to patient, stay calm, identify who you are, and that you're here to help. Your goal is to find out who will need help most urgently. Here your victims in order from the list placed in the comment section of part two of this series. Number one, male in his 30s, complains of pain in his left leg, which is obviously fractured. Respiration is 24, pulse is strong, CRT is one second, no excessive bleeding. Respirations are within acceptable range, less than 30. Pulse and CRT normal. Complains of pain, communicating where it hurts, and so therefore mental status probably normal. This patient is tagged yellow, needs care, but will not die if there's a reasonable delay. Move on. Two, female in her 50s, bleeding from the nose, ear, and mouth. Trying to sit up, but can't. 
respirations 20, pulse present, CRT one second, not responding to your commands. This victim may have a significant head injury, but is stable from the standpoint of respirations and perfusion, but her mental status is impaired. She is tagged red, immediate, move on. Three, teenage girl bleeding heavily from her right thigh, respirations 32, pulse 30, CRT 2.5 seconds, follows commands. This victim is seriously hemorrhaging, one of the reasons to treat during triage. Respirations elevated, perfusion impaired. You use your unskilled male helper to apply pressure by placing his hands on the bleeding area and applying direct pressure. Direct pressure might stop the bleeding. You use your t-shirt as a dressing and it turns out he has a belt. You use it as a tourniquet and the bleeding abates. Tag red. You don't really have to assess mental status. You and your female helper move on. Four, another teenage girl, small laceration on the forehead, but says she can't move her legs. Respirations 20, pulse strong, CRT one second. Probable spinal injury, but otherwise stable and can communicate. Tag yellow, move on. Five, male in his 20s, head wound, respirations absent, airway repositioned, still no breathing. If not breathing, you reposition the head to ensure an open airway or place an airway if you have one. This fails to restart breathing. This patient is deceased for all intents and purposes. Tag black and move on. Six, male in his 40s, burns on his face, chest, and arms. Respirations 22, pulse 100, CRT 1.5 seconds, follows commands. This victim has significant burns on large areas, but is breathing well, has normal perfusion. Mental status is unimpaired, but in too much pain to get up. You tag yellow and move on. Seven, teenage boy, multiple cuts and abrasions, but not hemorrhaging, but says he cannot breathe. Respirations 34, radial pulse present, CRT 2.5 seconds. This victim doesn't look so bad, but respirations are too fast and his perfusion appears impaired. Mental status is normal, but he likely has some type of internal bleeding, possibly in the thorax. You tag red and move on. Eight, female in her 20s, burns on neck and face, respirations 22, pulse present, CRT one second, asked to be helped up and can walk, although with a limp. Obviously injured, this young woman is otherwise stable and communicating. With assistance, she's able to stand up and can walk by herself. She becomes another one of the walking wounded. Tag green, point her to the other green victims and move on. Nine, elderly woman bleeding profusely from an amputated right arm below the elbow. Respirations 36, pulse on other wrist absent, CRT three seconds, unresponsive. Obviously in dire straits, you use your helper's scarf as a tourniquet and sacrifice that person, your remaining helper, to apply pressure on the bleeding area. You tag red and move on. 10, male child, multiple penetrating injuries, respirations absent. But you reposition the airway and he starts breathing. Radio pulse is absent, CR2, however, is two seconds, uh, unresponsive. You initially think this child is deceased, but you follow protocol, reposition his airway by tilting his head back, and he starts breathing even without an oral airway, to your surprise, so you tag him red. He's bleeding heavily from his injuries, so you apply pressure and wait for the additional help you originally requested to arrive. You've just performed triage on 20 victims, including the walking wounded, in 10 minutes or less. Help begins to arrive, including the ICU nurse that you contacted initially. You're no longer the most experienced medical resource at the scene and allow more qualified personnel to take command. There's still much to do, but you've performed your duty to identify those victims who need the most urgent care. In normal times, modern medical facilities will already have ambulances and trained personnel with lots of equipment on the scene. In a collapse, however, the prognosis for many of our victims is grave. Go over our list of victims again and see who you think would survive if modern medical care was not available. Many of the red tags and even some of the yellow tags would be at risk of dying from their injuries. This is Joe Alton, MD, that old Dr. Bones wishing you the best of health and good times or bad. Thanks for watching. Hey, if you need a solid medical kit for the range, for that hunting trip, or for disaster settings, check out Nurse Amy's entire line at store.doomandbloom.net. Thanks again. <music>